Right, so uh, good morning everybody. Um, we are the Gas Turbine Builders Association. Uh, we are basically a group of amateur model engineers who just love things that spin very fast and burn very hot. Gas turbines. What we got here is uh, a home-built KJ66. Uh, the 66 very simply is the rotor diameter in this particular instance. So we've got a single stage centrifugal compressor at the front, which is 66 millimeters diameter. And there's a single stage axial flow turbine at the back, which is also 66 mil diameter. And in the middle, we have a vaporizing combustor. And our primary fuel is kerosene or paraffin, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, and that doesn't vaporize at ambient temperature. So in order to start a, a gas turbine, the first thing we have to do is just warm up the vaporizer system. And we do that with a bottle of gas, uh, which just basically heats the whole thing up for a few seconds at the beginning of the run. Uh, and then we switch over to the kerosene once it's up to temperature and able to vaporize itself. So in order to start, a jet engine, rather like uh, a car, uh, an internal combustion car, as opposed to an electric car. Uh, we have a little starter motor here on the front and a Bendix drive. And so when we command the start, first thing it'll do is just drops onto the rotor, spins the rotor over. There's an RPM sensor here, and that will detect the free rotation of, of the rotor. The little box of tricks down here basically says, OK, the rotor's running freely and it will open the gas valve, let gas in. It'll turn the glow plug on. There's enough energy in that glow plug to ignite the gas. So what we should hear is a, a little bit of a whir and a pop as the starter motor and the gas goes in and ignites. Once that's ignited for a little while, that gas will be heating up the uh, vaporizers. Once the temperature rises over 100 degrees centigrade, then the fuel pump will start and gradually start to introduce the kerosene into the vaporizers. And you'll hear that as a pickup in energy. The whole thing will start to sound more alive, shall we say. And so once the temperature goes over 300 degrees, we know the kerosene is burning, so the gas is switched off, so we no longer need the gas. We're running completely on the kerosene. All the time, the starter motor is continuing to accelerate the rotor. So on a, a gas turbine, what we have to do is reach what's called the self-sustain speed. That's the point at which there's enough energy in the hot gases passing through the turbine that it can drive the compressor without any external mechanical input, i.e. without the starter motor. On this engine, that happens at about 22 to 23,000 RPM. The starter motor will then cut out, drop off the shaft, and it will then accelerate with its energy through the turbine. It will drive the rotor up to its idle speed, which on this engine is 35,000 RPM. Once at 35,000 RPM, authority is then given to the throttle, and I, I can do what I like with it before it won't pay any attention, but once it's happy and running steady, I'll then be able to use the throttle and then we could just demonstrate some of the throttle range. This engine uh, goes up to a fairly modest 120,000 RPM, at which point it is sucking in approximately five cubic feet of air per second, heating that air to uh, approximately 800 uh, degrees turbine entry temperature and it comes out at about 600 degrees. So that 200 degree drop is roughly the, uh, is all the energy being taken out of that gas flow by the turbine in order to drive the compressor. So internally, it's using approximately 20 brake horsepower just to keep itself running. So what we'll do is uh, we'll sort of give it a, a, a run up. Um, the reason I'm telling you all about it now is because it's quite noisy. Uh, and uh, so when you see, when I go through the start, when you see me put those on, the recommendation is fingers in ears. Uh, you'll probably do it naturally anyway. 
Uh, but uh, it's worthwhile saving what little hit. Well, certainly mine. I've got hearing aids now. <laughs> and uh, so we'll run it up. I'm going to take it up to about 110,000 RPM. That extra 10,000 up to 120 in this environment is not going to make any difference. What we have here is a perfect acoustic uh, environment whereby the hard floor, the tent, the tent, noise bounces around everywhere. So it's a lot, lot noisier in here than if it was on a model airplane flying around. If you have this on a model airplane and another uh, model airplane with an IC engine, you can't hear this. You have no idea. You can only fly them really without another uh, piston engine or anything in the air. Uh, two jets together, fine, but not a piston and a, and a jet. Anyway, so you, I know you won't believe me because you'll hear the noise, but uh, trust me. <laughs> right, let's uh, get everything plugged in. So everything was gets quite cold in there overnight, and everything was nice and cool, so just giving everything a nice warm up to start with. Um. Okay, that on, that on, and that on. Right, we should be ready. So hopefully, we're in a pot, fingers crossed. Ah, air bubble. Air bubble. <laughs> Right, try again. Hopefully that's got rid of it. Okay, that's 22,000, the starter motor's disconnected. It's now idling. When I get up to high throttle, watch that. And that's basically all it does. <laughs> so, as I was saying, the five cubic feet of air per second going in there, and the thrust, that is just the remaining fuel after it's shut down, that's just in the uh, manifold system, that's burned off. The starter motor has now dropped back in again, and is actually just pulling 
cold air through because the only way to stop a jet engine is to turn the fuel off. Um, it is sort of uh, rather like you can't, there's no ignition as such, so you can't turn the ignition off, it, it actually is stop the fuel flow. Um, and so when it was running, as I say, up, we got up to 110,000 RPM and it was pulling five cubic feet of air per second through there. And at the front here, it's at basically standstill. What we're standing in now, there's no air movement. So that's what's going in the front. Out the back, because the air is expanded by that massive temperature rise, it actually is coming out of the exhaust at just under 500 meters per second. And quite hot. And so this engine weighs about a pound and a half, so just, uh, just under a kilo. And that is producing a about uh, 16 pounds of thrust or seven kilos, whichever one you want to work in. So very, very high power to weight ratio. So if you can build them, your model airplane or whatever, under that seven kilo mark, then you can just let go and it will go straight upwards. That is, uh, saves having a runway. So. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway any questions? Um, I mean, probably the first one that normally comes up, so let me preempt it, is the bearings. There's the usual, yeah, what, what are the bearings? The bearings, we've got a, one bearing at the front, one bearing at the back, and uh, they're basically standard steel races, inner and outer, but we have ceramic balls and we have no cages. So their full name is uh, Full Complement Angular Contact Hybrid Ball Races which is a bit of a mouthful, but what that does is because they're angular contact, it means that we've got both axial and radial control of, of the rotor in there. So often we get asked, why don't you use air bearings for that kind of speed? Well, the trouble is if you use air bearings, that has to be only on, on the parallel axle, which means you then have to have a third bearing in there to deal with the actual thrust. So actually the two angular contacts are actually a much more simple solution. And these are especially designed uh, for, there's various applications that work at these kinds of speeds and temperatures. Um, and they are actually manufactured to run at 150,000 RPM at 300 degrees centigrade. And although that rear bearing uh, is in the middle uh, on the shaft and the duct around it taking that hot exhaust is only about 10 millimeters away from that bearing. The radiant heat from that exhaust in towards that bearing, 800 degrees technically radiant all the way around it. What we do, we actually run a two-stroke system. Sounds a bit odd for a jet engine but we have a little bit of lubricant in the fuel as it comes through the pump, there's a little T-junction here and a restrictor and part, a tiny amount of the flow goes through this lubricant line and that drips tiny amounts of the oily fuel mix between the back of the compressor and the front, of the be uh, front bearing. And at those kinds of speeds, the minute it touches the shaft, it atomizes. We also take some of the compressed air from the compressor and feed it down there. So you end up with an oily mist passing through the bearings and out, and it burns off on the way through the turbine. And what that basically means is, although we've got this duct all the way around that bearing, and it says, it says literally 10 millimeters around the bearing, so it's not far away, radiant heat is huge, but that mix actually is able to control the rear bearing temperature. There actually is a sensor there. Uh, and that rear bearing doesn't exceed 140 degrees. And I say the bearing is designed for 300, so kind of well within the limits of the bearings. Front bearing always is cooler anyway because it's getting all the cold, yeah, the air straight off the compressor. Anyway, uh, any other questions? Yeah, that, that's um, a, a very efficient vibration sensor. <laughs> I just keep an eye on it because obviously with everybody around, I just want to be sure that if I detect anything, I can shut it down before anything happens. Because as you can imagine, 110,000 RPM, it doesn't take long for things to go wrong 
And so if I'm listening, it's not good enough, but a finger there tells me very quickly. All right, thanks very much indeed.